Hey, hey, Marcus House with you here. Today we have found these two awesome missions off to Jewel and Val. These are both orbital station missions, and the first one here we need to put around Jewel. And the requirements for this is quite straightforward, but the next mission here we have around Val is much different. We need to have a bunch of electric charge, we need to have an ISRU resource conversion unit, we need to have 1500 units of monopropellant. Seeing as these two missions are worth over 2.4 million in funds, we are making a vessel here which is almost worth that same value. The damn thing is so big I can't even scroll up to it, so I've got to drag it right down here just so I can show it to you. We have a massive crew capacity in this thing, and up the top here we have our very sensitive parts there, covered by a very nice fairing. We're going to take a range of uh, crew members here. Um, we'll take three pilots, I think, and of course we're going to take Burberry Kerman. He is our number one pilot, in he goes. Uh, we'll grab Kimlin and uh, we might as well train up one of these other pilots. Logie Kerman, come down here, in you go. And I think we'll take two scientists. We might as well pop some scientists into our mobile processing lab. So there we go, we have uh, five there five crew for this journey for a very specific reason uh, which you'll see later so we'll launch this thing <laughs> now this vessel is absolutely monstrous weighing in at over 3600 ton for this very reason we needed a massive thrust to weight ratio of 1.64 we have an asparagus staging set up here with the six cores on the outside we are dropping those here we're not rolling this thing over too quickly because the drag on those top crew cabins is just colossal. There are a few vector engines on the bottom of this thing just to give us a little extra vectoring ability because yeah, this thing really does like to flip over. The key to a vessel like this of course is to make sure you don't stray too far away from your prograde marker otherwise that drag's just gonna flip it. Just getting a little heat there as we pass that 70 kilometer mark on the apoapsis there. And once we've drained that booster stage, of course, we're going to decouple that, fire those nerve rocket engines, and leave the booster to fall harmlessly back into the atmosphere. Just a few hundred meters per second to burn here just to circularize this orbit. Now this vessel, as soon as we circularize our orbit, has around 3,700 meters per second available to it from low Kerbin orbit. So what we can do with this is get all the way to Joule without doing any gravity assist. And with a few small gravity assists from Tylo at Joule, we should be able to quite easily get into an orbit of Val with just a little Delta V to spare. Setting up our encounter here with Jewel, and you can see that we almost need 2,000 meters per second of Delta V just to do this burn. We're actually going to do this burn in two passes around Kerbin. One is going to get us almost up to a Muna orbit, and the next is going to get us all the way to Jewel. So uh, yes, we are going to split this up. So there we go there, that is our first burn completed. We did a two minute burn on either side of our manoeuvre node there. Uh, that just makes it a little more efficient to do this in two passes. If you're trying to do it all in one pass, it's just too much. You end up burning at too much of an angle to be efficient. So as Kerbin screams away from us there as we blast out of the sphere of influence, we can head off to do a mid-course correction just to get our encounter with Jewel a little more accurate. In the real world, of course, there are small corrections made with vessels of this nature uh, quite frequently because the further away you are from your target, the smaller the correction needs to be to actually bring you in at the correct trajectory to do whatever it is that you need to do with your manoeuvre. In this case, of course, what we want to do is not only uh, encounter Jewel, but also encounter Tylo. We want to use Tylo to actually slingshot us in the opposite direction. And this is going to allow us to fall into a Jewel orbit without actually needing to spend any Delta V at all. Now, if you were to do this without using Tylo, you would actually need to spend quite a lot of Delta V just falling into an orbit of Jewel. Of course, you can use other bodies apart from Tylo to help you do this, but Tylo is the largest body and you can actually come quite close in there because it has no atmosphere as well. Now we have time warped just until we've touched the sphere of influence there of Joule. Now we'll do another finer correction again just to fine tune this gravity assist here from Tylo. 
we were able to get this very close from a long distance away, but uh, again, uh, you're talking about just a few fractions of a meter per second to uh, to try to get this really accurate from that distance. So it uh, it doesn't hurt to do another burn, and that just leaves us now to do a nice flyby there of Tylo. Now the reason that we are able to wipe off a lot of velocity from Jules' sphere of influence by using Tylo is because it's actually slinging us round basically in the opposite direction to what we're travelling in relation to Jules, so this in effect slows us down. So as Jewel falls away from us there, you'll see we've ended up in a very, very eccentric orbit there. And I've done this on purpose simply so uh, that I can come back around and meet up with Val. And that was basically because I couldn't do it in the first pass very easily. It just wasn't in the right position. Making some very fine adjustments at the apoapsis there. And this is going to allow us to come in very precisely. And just so that it's easy to actually eject out of Val's sphere of influence, we want to come in around the equatorial plane, or very close to it anyway. We have, of course, just completed our contract to build an orbital station around Jules, so that is great. We can now focus on our next one here around Val. As we pass the periapsis of Val, of course, we need to do a retrograde burn just to wipe off enough velocity to fall into an orbit. We're actually not going to circularize our orbit at all, and this is simply because we don't have a huge amount of delta V to spare, and we don't really need to. All we need to do is fall into an orbit, and it's quite nice sometimes to have an elliptical orbit simply because this lets us grab science instrument readings from space near Val as well as around Val. So, uh, yes, you can grab all sorts of readings there. So there we go, there we are now in an orbit of Val, and of course this means that we have completed our next contract. A beautiful shot there as we see Jewel rise over Val. What we'll do now is we'll just head up to our apoapsis here and we'll just raise that periapsis just high enough so that we can time warp very quickly, and this is so that we can time our ejection from Val's sphere of influence when we need to. But Marcus, I hear you say you do not have enough Delta V to get back to Kerbin from here, and you are quite right. That is why, hidden away in the cargo bay here, we have a little vessel with capacity for five Kerbals. So we're going to transfer all of our great little Kerbals over into this vessel. So there we go, the Kerbals are all loaded up. We can now undock this little thing, and we can use our RCS just to gently coax our way out of the cargo bay here. And of course we need to switch RCS on before we can do that. And there we go there, so coming out we can turn this thing and thrust outwards. Now our station is fully capable of communicating with Kerbin due to the massive array of antennas around it, so we can control this thing for as long as we like. We have a wonderful space station here for space tourists to visit in the future. Before we do depart however, it was very important for Burberry to jump out of the vessel and do a bit of a flyby of the ship which he's been piloting now for many years. Of course, this is the largest vessel ever created by all Kerbal kind. So Burberry just wants to ensure that it is left in the condition that he started flying it in, which is uh, very much like Burberry. He's a perfectionist in every sense of the word. He takes his job very seriously just ensuring that all of those crew cabins have not been damaged in this very long flight. I wonder, thinks Burberry, how many passengers can fit in this vessel. So with his inspection complete, Burberry with a tear in his eye, heads back towards the crew capsule to leave Val and this colossal mothership behind. It's okay though, Burberry does have the company of four other Kerbals for the long voyage home. So this little vessel here has over 1700 meters per second of Delta V available to it, and we're going to need over half that to eject from Val here. Before we do that though, we need to make sure that Val is in the right position. We want to eject from Val as Val is heading in a retrograde direction in relation to Jules' orbit. What this means is we are going to be slung out in a retrograde direction from Jules, meaning that we can actually reduce our orbital velocity around Kerbal and, uh, and drop down uh, to catch up, hopefully, with Kerbin. So we have our burn here of just over 1100 meters per second. This is going to be the vast majority of the Delta V we need to get all the way back to Kerbin, and this is simply because when we get to Kerbin, we don't need to break. We can actually use our heat shield here and do an aero break as we come into land. 
So goodbye to Val and Jewel as we blast out of the sphere of influence there. So we've ended up with a slight inclination difference here of negative 2.7 degrees. We can quite easily wipe this off because the, uh, the descending node there is up quite high there near the apoapsis marker. Of course, whenever you're doing an inclination change, it is always best to do it at the lowest velocity possible. Sadly, just because of the position of Kerbin in this particular orbit, we weren't able to catch it on this pass. What we need to do is just do a very, very slight change here in our velocity just to ensure that we encounter Kerbin on our next orbit. So in this case, a very small burn of just 30 meters per second basically reduces a massive amount of time in our next orbital period. So here we go, we've now got that encounter set up, but we need to fine tune it as well. We want to get ourselves nice and close so that we're coming in as close as we can to the atmosphere of Kerbin, hopefully over the equatorial plane in the same direction that Kerbin is spinning. This just means that we're not uh, basically trying to smash into the atmosphere against the direction that Kerbin's actually spinning. Spinning. We don't want to do that. So if anybody is wondering what visual mods I'm running here today, I have installed today the environmental visual enhancements mods with Planet Shine and also Scatterer. Now, uh, the other week I was using the stock visual enhancements pack, which just made everything look just a little bit different. So if you're wondering why uh, things look a little different to usual, that is why. As we plummet in towards Kerbin, we can see those very nice visual effects there. And of course, because I was so focused at checking out all of those visual effects, I forgot to decouple this stage in time. So yes, I ended up barely escaping with our lives. Lucky for me though, the heat shield there was pointed in the right direction just in time, so I didn't lose anything important. And I just thought it would be interesting here to pull out the heat shield readout so that we can check out how much ablator is actually needed when you re-enter the atmosphere at well over 4,400 meters per second. As it turned out, we still had over 300 ablator left there. So uh, this indicates to me that it's quite safe to remove quite a lot of ablator off your heat shields. Parachutes out there. Now I often get the question why I like to jettison my heat shields. Well, uh, yeah, check this out. <laughs> they pretty much never survive no matter what I do with them. Now of course I could have used landing legs in that situation except when you re-enter at that speed the landing legs only survive for about 3 seconds <laughs> before they explode. So there we go, we have completed those two contracts today. We also leveled up a few Kerbals as well, so bonus there. Now before we head off we're going to plant a few more flags on our Minmus base station. Now these two flags have been awarded to two very awesome subscribers who actually deciphered and found the hidden message in the YouTube thumbnail uh, over the last two weeks, so very well done guys. That first flag there for Sir McPotato and this second flag here for Tristan NG. So uh, thanks very much guys for playing and good luck to all of you out there trying to find the hidden message in this thumbnail and any other thumbnail that is coming up soon. Thank you everyone for making it this far and watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please take a second, give it a thumbs up. All of your support is just freaking amazing. Uh, if you have any questions for me, of course, whack them down in the comments below. And uh, yes, do follow me on Twitter at Marcus House Game if you want to be kept up to date with uh, just little things that I'm working on through the week. You guys are all awesome. We will see you in the next video. I'm just getting this as close to touchdown as possible. So we'll ditch that stage, fire that Terrier engine, and hopefully touch down gently here enough to be able to keep standing, because if we can't stand this thing, we're screwed. And touchdown, yes, for the first time on Elu. There we go there with the very simplest craft possible. Although I shouldn't talk.